Hello. So during class, we had a student uh, who, uh, after we introduced the Kelvin Planck statement, asked a question about a video that they'd seen uh, online. So just to remind you the Kelvin Planck statement, uh, this is a statement of the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us essentially uh, of all the processes that could exist that respect the first law of thermal, which ones are actually possible. So the Kelvin Planck statement, uh, it says it is impossible for any system to operate in a thermodynamic cycle and deliver a net amount of work to its surroundings while receiving energy by heat transfer from a single thermal reservoir. Okay, so here, let me just, um, let me share a whiteboard and I'm just gonna sketch this out. So actually here, let me just rewrite, uh, let me rewrite our statement. So here, so we're looking at the Kelvin Planck, Kelvin Planck statement. And I'm gonna stretch this out a little bit, just so it fits, bloop, like that. And the Kelvin Planck statement says that it is impossible uh, for any system to operate in a thermodynamic cycle. Uh, to operate in a thermodynamic cycle and deliver a net amount of work to its surroundings while receiving energy by heat transfer from a single thermal reservoir. Okay, I'm going to stretch my box again so this fits and yeah, well, Zoom doesn't know how to cut words properly, so here we're just gonna stop it here. Okay, so if I was gonna if I was gonna draw this, so what it's what the Kelvin Planck statement says is that I cannot have a machine that works like this. I can't have a thermal reservoir at temperature T, and then I, there's no way that I can set any kind of device on top. I'm gonna put an arrow in the middle like this just to show this is operating in a cycle it would receive heat and it would give a net amount of work to the surrounding work or power in this case in this direction. So this device cannot exist according to Kelvin Planck. So then the student said, well, I've seen a video online of somebody who just set some beads on a, on a, a hot plate and the beads started jumping. So here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come out of this, I'm gonna come out of this whiteboard and I'm gonna bring my video here, so let me just share my screen. I'm gonna share this desktop, there you go. And it's called B d'hydrogel dans une poêle chaude. So here, can I make this bigger? So we're gonna turn on this video. There we go, that works. So we're gonna play this video here. And I think this is Russian. We're gonna learn the Russian word for pancake. Oh, let me set it back to the beginning. So we just have a hot plate. And what happens here is we take these beads and then person drops the beads and then they just start bouncing around. And this is really weird. This looks like we could violate the Calvin Planck statement with this, right? We could make a machine that would actually work. And you've seen the six there or the nine so that the stove is actually set on, on a high setting. And that's quite important to explaining what happens here. So you see these beads are just continuously jumping around and as they come down, they get another little kick and then they keep going up. So this looks like it's violating the Kelvin Planck statement, but there's two here, I'm gonna pause it. So there's two important details. The person made pancakes before and the stove is still set to either six or nine. I think it must be a nine there. So it's actually a pretty high, uh, it's a pretty high number. And the other uh, important thing is it says here, this is hydrogel. So we're going to remind ourselves. So what's happening here? So here, we just stop to share. Let's see if I still have my scribblings on my whiteboard. I really hope so. Yes. Okay. So similar to how uh, we prove the equivalence of the Clausius and the Kelvin Planck statements, we can uh, we could build. So with the pan, we could build a um, we could build a cycle that violates Kelvin Planck. So we would have our hot plate. And then I have a bead down there and it's getting heat. Oh, let me just, uh, let me just move my state one there. There we go. 
So this is my state one. The bead is at the bottom of the plate. There's a heat source underneath and that gives heat to the bead. And it seems to be, I mean, the heat is the only thing in the plate. So it seems to be making it jump around. So at state two, the, the bead has jumped up a certain amount. And now what I'm going to do is I can imagine, well, instead of letting the bead just fall back down and dissipate the energy by hitting the plate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you're in state three. So this is my process one to two, whoop, out there to three. So I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab that bead with some magic glue thing, either glue trap or if it's a metallic bead, maybe I'll put a little magnet if it's, if it's ferromagnetic. And this bead is going to be hooked onto a set of pulleys or this, this little magnet or hook. And there's a little weight. And the bead, as it comes back down, instead of just falling down, it's going to bring the weight up and set it here. I've got, a, I've got a, a, an elevated surface. And then I'm going to set this weight out onto the table and unhook it. And there's another weight here wait, waiting. So the weight is going to go and get set on the table. And when it comes to, when the bead comes down, then that hook is going to disconnect. And then the rope will come down and grab the next weight, uh, the next weight. And then we'll come back to state four. The bead is at the bottom. There's still fire, but now I've got one weight on top and only one weight on the bottom. And now we're waiting again. So I've got my pulleys and my hook. And so now the bead, we're gonna come back to state one where now the bead is getting heat and it makes it jump up and I'm gonna catch it. Okay, so this is not, so this appears to be violating the second law, but it is not. And that's because what's happening. Um, so here there's two things. Um, so it is impossible for any system to operate. Here, I'm gonna switch color. I'm gonna put this in orange in a thermodynamic cycle. This is very important. So a cycle has to be able to operate continuously. And this is not a cycle because these are hydrogel beads. So we saw that uh, in the description of the video, these are hydrogel beads. And what are hydrogel beads? These are tiny little beads that when I put them in water, they actually absorb water in. And so what's happening, actually, let me go back to the, um, let me go back to my, scribblings uh, what's actually happening is something that's related to the light and frost effect so i'm going to erase this erase what's here so what makes the beads jump is not just a transfer of energy it's not just a transfer of heat it's the fact that we're transferring heat to a bead that is filled with water so what happens is we have a really hot plate and the bead is in, and the material that the bead is made of is able to trap water. Uh, and they're meant, so these beads are meant that you would, you would fill up a whole lot of them, and then you would drop them in a vase, and basically they'll release water very slowly. So if you have, uh, if you have flowers in there, they'll get like slowly watered uh, throughout time. So what happens is that when heat transfers, and that's why it's so important to see that the stove was on a high setting. So because the pan is so hot, what happens is that a little layer of water inside the bead just evaporates. It just gets all the heat and then it turns to steam. And that little pocket of steam is at a high pressure and then it expands and it pushes the bead up. It's like a tiny little fart. And then the bead jumps up because there's a little, there's a little tiny little cloud of steam that pushed it up and then it's gonna come back down afterwards. And when it hits again, then there's another little layer of water that turns to steam and then psoop, it moves up to another little fart of steam and then it's going to keep going down. Now the important part is that this is not a thermodynamic cycle. There is a battery and the battery is the water that is contained inside the bead. If you leave the bead on the pan to do this over and over and over again, it's not in a thermodynamic cycle. Eventually you're going to deplete the water because once the steam is formed, it escapes. It goes out into the surrounding air. So it's like you've you've charged up. So by by it's like a water battery. By putting the beads inside of uh, or by by letting the beads absorb water, what you've done is you've recharged your battery with water, 
where you're, you're, you've put potential energy, which is the liquid water, and then we set it on the hot surface, you're releasing that energy by letting it transition to gas by transferring Q. And that's what allows you to create this little bit of kinetic energy that moves, uh, or this transfer of mechanical energy that transfers to kinetic energy into the bead jumping around. But eventually, if you let it do this long enough, you're going to run out of water. The bead will be empty. All of that water will have evaporated, and then it's going to stop jumping. So we are not violating the second law because it is not a thermodynamic cycle. Each time in our, in our drawing there where we had those four steps, when we got to the end, we weren't actually at state one. We were at a different state because there was less water in my system. I am depleting resources inside the system. And that's very important. This does not violate the Kelvin Planck statement. So this is actually related to uh, something called uh, the Leiden frost effect. So I'm going to bring up, I'm going to see a couple of examples there of the Leiden frost effect. Um, so here's our beads. I'm going to close, I'm going to take this out. Actually, I'm going to keep these, uh, these links. So here's one example. So here's a really uh, impressive video. Someone's going to sweat their hand through basically molten metal, which you would think you would get burnt, but his hand is not burnt. So Mythbusters try this. And what's actually happening, if you let me go back. So what they're going to explain is that as the person is sweating their hand through the molten metal, the moisture on your hand actually evaporates. So just that the moisture on the top of your hand evaporates almost instantly. And then that creates a protective gas layer. So essentially there's a, there's a, a layer of, of steam that forms around your hand and prevents the heat from the molten metal from touching your, your skin and burning you. And this is what's happening. So Mythbusters uh, actually tried this and then you can see them. This is a pot of molten metal. I forget exactly which, uh, which metal they used here. So here they're creating their, I guess this is tin. Um, so they're melting it. It's at a high temperature. I mean, 900 Fahrenheit, it's very hot. And then they're dumping their hand into cold water. And then they're just gonna go very quickly. And that's the important bit is you can't you cannot leave your hand in there for too long, right? Because if you wait long enough, then that steam is going to, it's going to, to get pushed out, it'll go off. And then the, there'll be a contact of the metal with your hand. So whenever there's a very big temperature difference, either with something very hot or with something very cold, you'll get the light and frost effect. You can see, you can actually, so if you want a more uh, scientific uh, looking, or if you want to do this, um, uh, if you want to do a, a more scientific uh, looking video, here's one from the Royal Institution where they do a similar demonstration, but with liquid nitrogen. So if you dump, um, so liquid nitrogen is extremely cold. And basically what they're going to do is that they're going to dump. So the first demonstration is dumping a flower. So here they're, they're dumping a, a, a marguerite, a, day, a, a lily or a daisy, but you leave it in. And now it's going to freeze. It actually is going to freeze solid. And then it's going to break like glass. That's right. So back home, now, if you drop very quickly. So if you drop just a small amount, you'll see they're not leaving their hand in, they're just dropping it over their hand. And you'll see they're not getting frostbite. And in fact, if you look closely, you're able to see tiny little uh, beads of liquid nitrogen rolling off the skin. If you look, you see this little glimmering And you can actually see the liquid nitrogen just sort of going over. And that's what's happening. So the liquid nitrogen is so cold that as soon as it touches the skin, that liquid actually evaporates. 
and there's a little layer of gaseous nitrogen that forms around the liquid between the liquid and your hand, and that's what protects your hand from the frostbite. But what's important is it shouldn't stay in contact. Um, and actually, there's a there's a so they do another. I find that demo is pretty bad, but they give an example here towards the end. There we go. Of protective gear. So here's an example of. Uh, a glove for cold protection that's a very highly insulated glove and this would be a good idea but actually um, it can be kind of dangerous and there's an explanation for this is you see this wide opening here so if liquid nitrogen pours into that opening and gets trapped inside the glove with your hand then it's game over then you're going to get frostbite so in some situations it can actually be more dangerous to be wearing this glove um, than to just not be wearing it at all. If you want to do this at home, you can do this in just a pan. So here we're going to get a, a good shot of this. So if you if you get just a a hot pan or a metal pan, and you here I'm going to the, the voice is kind of annoying, but if you set the stove to very high and you put the pan on and you let the pan get very very warm. When you put water in, and you may have seen this before, so you get a little bit of water and you drop it on, and you'll see these beads of water going around. And what's happening is that underneath the, the water droplet, there's a little protective layer of steam that forms. As soon as the water gets too close to the pan, it evaporates. There's a small layer that evaporates very fast. And it's basically these beads of water are riding on, an, on the steam cushion. I almost said air cushion, but it's not an air cushion, it's a steam cushion. If you have a really hot pan, you're trying to lower uh, the temperature, you can see it under the sink as well. So you can actually try this at home. This is the light and frost effect. And this is what propels, it's related to uh, the mechanism by which these hydrogel beads are being uh, propelled into the air. <laughs> 